Dear must leave the scene destroyed by Jesus as the word. word, word, word. about the Passover not falling in March or April. In ancient times, this month was added by observation. Go ahead. The Sanhedrin observed the conditions of the weather, the crops, and the livestock, and if these were not sufficiently sufficiently advanced to be considered spring, right. then the Sanhedrin inserted an additional month into the calendar to make sure that the Peshach, the Passover, would occur in the spring. Right. It is, after all, called the festival of the spring. was the new moon leading into spring last year.
a hum in its beat. From the um, I got the phases of the new moon from the, uh, the, the navy. navy. All right. U.S. naval. Uh, Come in and see if we get a shot. Oceanography. All right. Now, this this was the new moon leading into spring last year. All right. 14 days later, we had the Passover, the night of the, what what on the Greg Gregorian calendar they call the 20th. All right. Last year was a leap year. All right. So what it what it what did the document say happens on a leap year in Hebrew? In the Hebrew calendar, it jumps forth, right? And it's normally 19 days longer, right, than a solar year, right? Right. So that's that's about give or take 19 days. Alright? Because it said about 19 days. Oh, now hold it steady. Get this shot. 
to the 25th, from the 7th to the okay. 25th. Okay. All right? Now, go next year, all right? From the 25th, we on a regular cycle now. God willing, we out of here, but if we have to do the Passover one more year, it's gonna be on a regular year, so it's 11 days shorter. Mm -hmm. Is that not 11 days shorter than the 25th? GMS leave the scene destroyed by Jesus of the Word. This is uh, Abu Khamar al-Masihi on behalf of uh, Truth After Knowledge. Now, uh, before I get into the subject of this video, I want to set the tone by noting a couple of comments which were posted on past Truth After Knowledge videos. Uh, you can see the two comments on your screen. The first one dates all the way back to 2009 and uh, was posted by a gentleman writing under the name False Prophet Killer. And that uh, was posted to the last video we did on Great uh, Millstone Scrambled Calendar uh, for our old account. Uh, we had made several videos refuting and exposing uh, GMS's twisted calendar and false prophet killer humorously noted that by the fifth video it was like we were beating a dead horse. Uh, the second comment is from a gentleman writing under the name uh, Prophet 613 and uh, he posted that on uh, one of our most recent videos and that comment uh, Prophet expressed surprise that members of GMS would post video footage in which they uh, cut themselves. Uh, the reason why I bring up these two comments is because in this video, I would like to look at some footage from GMS, which is quite relevant to both comments. Uh, first, because the recent clip that I'm about to show uh, demonstrates that the so-called elders of uh, Great Millstone still have more to learn about the calendar. And uh, second, because it provides a great example of them cutting themselves without even knowing it. Uh, the clip is from last February, and as you watch it, keep in mind that Tahar is going over Leviticus 23, 15, and 16. Uh, and is, and he, that he's acknowledging that the text is stating that seven consecutive Sabbaths plus a day amounts to 50 days. Here's the clip. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be, com shall be complete. Uh, first. Oh, okay, that's the, um, that's the, the, uh, um, the first fruit, all right? It said, after that Sabbath, you should count to you seven Sabbath so that's 40 that's 49 days then after that last Sabbath you add the next day and that becomes a, um, a, a special day so it's 50 days in all right read that part again about the Sabbaths go ahead it says and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering seven Sabbaths shall be complete even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. It says seven Sabbaths. That's why I say weeks with an S. 
How many weeks? Seven weeks. Then the day after that last day became 50 days. You had your 47 weeks or seven Sabbaths. Sabbaths represent 49 days. Then the day following makes it the 50th day. That's why in Acts, the second chapter, they use the term Pentecost, which is a Greek term meaning 50 for what? The, the first fruit. That's when they received the uh, spiritual power. Okay, uh, in our very first video on uh, Great Millstone's poor sense of chronology, uh, on our, which was made for our previous account, we noted precisely this passage, along with Deuteronomy 16.9, uh, uh, because together they show that it's possible for seven consecutive Sabbaths to correspond with seven consecutive weeks and equal 49 days. Now, the reason why this is significant is because it serves as a refutation of uh, Great Millstone's Lunar Sabbath Doctrine, though amazingly they couldn't see it even as they were reading the passage from Leviticus. Now, note that the Septuagint version of the passage in Leviticus translates the relevant phrase as weeks rather than Sabbaths. In fact, it employs the exact same phrase in both passages, as you can see here. Uh, this is also the case with other ancient translations like the Latin Vulgate, and it's also the case with modern translations like the NIV and uh, various others. Uh, in other words, the text is using the word Sabbath somewhat indirectly as interchangeable with weeks. The text means seven weeks, and the reason the word Sabbath can be used in this way is because in a system where every seventh day, such as uh, every Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, is a Sabbath, it's possible for seven Sabbaths to add up to 49 days. However, such is not possible on the lunar Sabbath system endorsed by Great Millstone. Uh, let me repeat that to be as clear as possible. The Bible presupposes a situation where it's possible for seven consecutive Sabbaths to amount to 49 days. That sort of situation is possible under the system where Friday sundown to Saturday sundown is a Sabbath. That sort of situation, however, is not possible under Great Millstone's lunar Sabbath system. Therefore, what Tahar failed to realize is that Leviticus 23 was presupposing a system like the Friday sundown to Saturday sundown system, where a Sabbath comes every seventh day. The passage in Leviticus 23 contradicts Great Millstone's lunar Sabbath innovation. To show this, let's first note that according to the lunar Sabbath doctrine, the first the 1st, the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th day of each lunar month is a Sabbath. You can see Tahar alluding to this uh, position uh, in the doctrine here. So the Sabbath falls on the first day, the new moon. Then it falls on the seventh day at evening, which is the eighth day. Then it falls on the 14th day at evening, which is the 15th day. You can uh, also hear Orion Law describe the same system in the uh, following clip. And it was connected to the moon on the 22nd, which by default causes the 8th, 15th, and 29th to also be Sabbaths. And he's correct. And we've all, beginning with Elder Tahar, we've always said that. We've always said that the, the new moon is the first day of the month, which is the Sabbath. Matter of fact, I'll break it down for you like this. The new moon, which is the first day, which is the first Sabbath, right? So that's the first day. Six days work shall be done, and then the seventh day is the Sabbath right so if the new moon is a sabbath which is the first day and you do work six days right one and six is what seven right so then the second sabbath of the month would come in when on the eighth day why because the new moon day one sabbath six days work right that's seven days six and one is seven then the next day after the six days of work is a sabbath which is the eighth day so the second sabbath of the month would be seven plus one which is eight it says from the second Sabbath to the third is seven more days, etc., 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 right? So then here you have it, right? So you have the first day, right, which is the Sabbath. Then six days work shall be done, and the seventh day shall be a Sabbath. So one plus seven is eight, right? That's the next Sabbath after the new moon. Eight plus seven is what? Fifteen. That's the next Sabbath. Fifteen plus seven is what? The twenty-second day. That's another Sabbath. Twenty-two plus seven is what? 29 day the 29th day which is another sabbath then from that point on that's when the cycle would change right now to offer an example let's note that great millstone's version of the uh hebrew lunar calendar for 2008 and 2009 let's uh, take a look at this note that according to tahar passover uh began on the 15th day of the begins on the 15th day of the month and ends seven days later which would correspond to the 22nd day of the month 
uh, note further that uh, Pentecost, or alternatively called First Fruits, in the 2009 version of the calendar, falls exactly 50 days after that day, uh, which to our sights is the end of Passover. So going by the Lunar Sabbath model, let's see if we can start at the 22nd day of the month, count seven consecutive Sabbaths after that, and wind up with 49 days. Now note that the typical lunar month averages 29 and a half days. More practically, let's just say that a lunar month uh, is always either 29 days long or 30 days long. Uh, for the sake of making the experiment easier, and in a way which would benefit uh, Tahar, as it would add more days to the count as we go along, let's presuppose for now that a lunar month is simply 30 days long. Okay, so let's start on the 22nd day of the month, which according to Tahar's calendar, corresponds with the end of Passover. And from here we're going to count seven consecutive Sabbaths. The next Sabbath is seven days away and falls on the 29th day of the month. So that's one Sabbath and seven days so far. However, note that we're now near the end of the month, and according to the Lunar Sabbath system, the next Sabbath will be the first day of the following month. Assuming the current month is 30 days long, the next Sabbath is only two days away. Thus, we wind up on the first day of the following month and have now accumulated two Sabbaths, but only nine days. The next Sabbath after that is seven days away on the eighth day of the new month that we're in. Thus, when we go across three consecutive Sabbaths, we cover 16 days. The fourth consecutive Sabbath is on the 15th day and brings us to a total of 23 days. The fifth consecutive Sabbath is on the 22nd day of the month and brings us to a total of 30 days. The sixth consecutive Sabbath is on the 29th day of the month and brings our total to 37 days. But once again, we're near the end of the month. And again, presupposing the month is 30 days long, the next Sabbath is only two days away on the first day of the month that comes after. Thus, at the seventh consecutive Sabbath, we have only collected 39 days. And that was presupposing that each month was, was uh, 30 days long. If one of the months was 29 days long, we would have amassed only 38 days, and if both months were 29 days long, we would have amassed only 37 days. So, I invite people to try it themselves. Try it yourself. Pick any day in the calendar and try to count seven consecutive Sabbaths, and see if you can ever reach 49 days on the Lunar Sabbath system. The only way seven consecutive Sabbaths could add up to 49 days on the Lunar Sabbath model is if the number of days in a month were a multiple of seven minus one. In other words, if the months were 27 days long or 34 days long. But that's never the case. Months are always 29 or 30 days long, so you have these situations at the end of the month where one Sabbath is just a day or two away from the next Sabbath. Uh, so it's simply not possible on the Lunar Sabbath model for seven consecutive Sabbaths to ever equal 49 days. Uh, with the Friday sundown to Saturday sundown system, however, it can be achieved, for example, if you start from a day which is itself a Sabbath. Okay, so let me repeat what I said earlier. On a system like, like the Friday sundown to Saturday sundown Sabbath, it is possible for seven consecutive Sabbaths to equal 49 days. On the lunar Sabbath model, endorsed by Great Millstone, it is not possible for seven consecutive Sabbaths to ever equal 49 days. Therefore, the fact that, by Tar's own admission, Leviticus 23 presupposes the possibility of seven consecutive Sabbaths equal 49 days, that means that the so-called elders of Great Millstone cut their own Lunar Sabbath doctrine when they read that passage. They cut themselves without even knowing it. You know, uh, Tahar can now either admit that the Lunar Sabbath doctrine is false, or if he's stubborn and obstinate, he can try to go the route that other Lunar Sabbatarians have gone, twisting and torturing the text and coming up with a silly new interpretation where, you know, one counts seven, seven Sabbaths from Passover and then adds another 50 days on top of that and then finally reaches Pentecost, you know, which would place Pentecost about 80 to 90 days after Passover rather than 50 days after Passover, you know. But that's pretty silly. Another possibility is for them to suddenly try to change their doctrine and, uh, and now deny that the uh, 29th day is a Sabbath. In, under words, in other words, under this uh, alternative system, the 22nd day of the month would be a Sabbath, and the next Sabbath would not be until the first day of the next month. Uh, the problem with that system is uh, then there would there would be more than six days between those two Sabbaths. In other words, rather than having people work for six days and then rest, it could be seven or eight days between Sabbaths, depending on the month. Uh, furthermore, 
Even on that model, it would still be impossible to start specifically on a Sabbath, count seven consecutive Sabbaths after that, and wind up with 49 days. For example, under a model where the 29th day is not a Sabbath, starting on the 22nd day of the month and then counting seven consecutive Sabbaths after that would give one between 51 and 53 days, depending on the lengths of the uh, months. Uh, whatever the case, in the end, the reality is that Tahar got refuted by the very Bible he was reading from and didn't know it. What does this say about the claim that he's a prophet who has the true understanding of the scriptures? The fact that he would miss this obvious cut in the very text which is right under his nose shows that he's just bluffing when he makes such claims. He's not an actual prophet, and his understanding of the scriptures are not guided by God. Sorry. Greetings. This is Abu Hamar al-Masihi. Uh, on behalf of Truth After Knowledge. Uh, Great Millstone started their uh, so-called Passover about a week ago, and before I begin cutting into them in this video, I'd like to first say, uh, in a spirit of goodwill, that I hope they enjoyed their festivities. Okay, uh, having said that, uh, the recent passing of one of, uh, another one of G uh, GMS's Passovers gives us another opportunity to discuss their twisted version of the Hebrew lunar calendar. And this is an important subject, as they still haven't got it right yet. Uh, it's our prayer that by the end of this video, others will see why we think this subject is so important. So let's begin by first noting that the Hebrew calendar provided by Great Millstone is put together by Tahar himself, as is noted in the following clip. Now me and this brother work together to put the calendar together, together every year that you brothers go to and you find out what high holy days come in, what day and so forth, and when the new moons come in. That clip is uh, also helpful in that it provides uh, Great Millstone's calendar for 2011. But before getting into their calendar for 2011, let's go all the way back to their calendars for 2008 and 2009, as uh, that's how far their systemic errors go back. It's my intention to go through the history of Tahar's ever-changing calendar since 2008. Here you can see Great Millstone's calendars for 2008 and 2009 lined up right next to each other. Uh, there's a number of contradictions between them, which were covered in some of our previous videos, which I don't want to get into at this time. Uh, for now, I simply want to focus on specifically two lines, those being the ones which cover Passover and Pentecost, or uh, First Fruits, which is the other name for Pentecost. Uh, as you may recall in our video on the uh, Lunar Sabbath, uh, it was noted that back in 2008 and 2009, GMS used to hold Pentecost, or First Fruits, 50 days after the end of their Passover, at the end of their uh, Days of Unleavened Bread. Uh, you can see that here. In 2008, the uh, Feast Days of Unleavened Bread ended on February 27th, and Pentecost came in 50 days later on April 18th. So too in 2009, their Days of Unleavened Bread ended on March 17th, and uh, First Fruits came in 50 days later on May 7th. So keep this in mind as we go on. GMS used to have Pentecost 50 days after Passover. Now let's look at their calendar for 2010. You may notice that at the top of the screen, it states the following, quote, the Passover date has been updated, end quote. What this means is that in their original 2010 calendar, uh, they had one date for Passover and then they changed it. The reality is that they changed the date by bumping it up a month later than the original date. So now, looking at their calendar for 2010, let's focus on specifically the lines for Passover and First Fruits. Remember how in the previous two calendars, Great Millstone started 50 days after the last day of Unleavened Bread? Well, now it's slightly over 20 days after. That's because Tahar jumped the date for Passover ahead a month, but forgot to change the date for First Fruits. And thus, with the loss of nearly 30 days, we get this totally unscriptural and unjustifiable situation where First Fruits falls a mere 22 days after the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now let's switch to, 2000, uh, to, to Har's uh, 2011 calendar, that the same problem has carried over uh, where First Fruits falls just a little over 20 days after the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread. But it gets even more interesting when we compare the 2010 calendar to the 2011 calendar. Uh, you can see the calendar for 2010 in blue on the top here, and the calendar for 2011 is underneath it. Now, let's focus on specifically the dates for Passover. Note that, that the date fell back about 11 days, which is understandable when working with the lunar calendar against the solar calendar. However, now let's compare the dates of Hanukkah and Purim. Notice that those dates jumped forward about 19 days. 
Now, this is an utter contradiction between the two calendars, where the date for Passover is falling backwards, while the dates for Hanukkah and Purim are jumping forward, and a number of the other holidays jump forward as well. Now, the reason why this happened is because Tahar was aware of some of the contradictions in his 2010 calendar and was trying to adjust them, but he didn't get all the errors. For example, keep in mind that, that Passover is supposed, supposed to fall in the first month, and Hanukkah is supposed to fall in the ninth month. That means that there should be eight new moons between Passover and Hanukkah. But if you go through the dates on the 2010 calendar, there are only six new moons between Passover and Hanukkah. This is because in 2009 and 2010, Tahar twice corrected the date of Passover without changing some of the other dates in the calendar. In other words, he jumped Passover ahead two months without ever jumping the other dates ahead those months. And thus, in, by the 2010 calendar, he had lost two months. Now, by having the date for Passover fall back while the date for Hanukkah jumps forward a month in the 2011 calendar, Tahar only partially corrected the problem. Go ahead and count the moons again uh, for yourself, and you'll see that there are only seven new moons between Passover and Hanukkah in the 2011 calendar when it's supposed to have eight new moons between them. Thus, even though he made a little bit of a correction, it, the, the calendar is still contradicting the scriptures. Now, the question is, how did this happen? How could a man who claims to be a prophet and claims to be the only one with the true understanding of the scriptures commit so many basic errors? The answer to this question is something that we'll get into in a second. But in order to answer it, let's now run through a brief history of GMS's calendar. In 2008, Great Millstone started their Passover on February 20th, which struck many as bizarre. So a number of people, including people who were following them, questioned them on that. And uh, three days later, on February 23rd of 2008, Tahar attempted to give a defense of that date. As you watch this clip, note in particular the part where Tahar says that it's possible for the calendar to slide back continuously for 10 years straight. And keep that in mind. A lot of brothers have problems with the fact that we, we said that the Passover was held uh, a couple of days ago. So one guy said, I mean, he wasn't saying it to be wicked. But they said, wait a minute, isn't the Passover supposed to be somewhere around March, April? Now, how many days is in a year according to the Gregorian calendar? 365. Now, the Hebrew calendar is supposed to have how many, how many days in a year? It's supposed to have about 360. It works out to about 360, not exactly 360. Right, 354, all right? So really, a year is supposed to be no more than what? Three, to round it off, 360 days. So what they're doing is they're adding five more days. So really it's supposed to go back, go up five or six days, five days. Because if you if you if you have five more days, they're gonna go up. So really you gotta do, wait a minute, you gotta count five days back. So now what if that happens for ten years? That's 50 days you got to go backwards. So what's so hard to believe about the Passover not falling in March or April? So that was Tahar's attempt to defend the ridiculous February 20th date. The various members of uh, Truth After Knowledge back in 2008 attacked Tahar for his uh, elementary understanding of how the lunar calendar works. It was a very basic and uh, simplistic understanding. Uh, we even got back word uh, back in 2008 after we had done that we got back word that even other UPKers who were outside of GMS who had seen the drama unfold were saying behind closed doors that we quote unquote cut Tahar on that subject now because Tahar got cut so bad and because you know and perhaps attempting to avoid a similar controversy in 2009 he uh, jumped the date for Passover ahead to March 11th this contradicted his original depiction of the lunar calendar as continuously sliding backwards. So, Truth After Knowledge launched a number of new arguments against his about face, about this 180 degree turn. Now, it was then that Tahar's young followers in Texas got involved. Uh, this is the group of young men which has alternatively called itself Man Up Jacob, Man Up Yaquab, and perhaps some other names. Uh, anyway, in the video, that they made, they tried to pretend that Tahar was simply going by the metonic cycle, where the lunar calendar falls back for two or three years against the solar calendar and then has a leap year in which it jumps forward 30 days. In other words, uh, it would gain 19 days vis-a-vis uh, -vis the previous date. Now, Truth After Knowledge went on to release a, 
multiple videos exposing how naive and erroneous their attempt to cover for him, for Tahar was, and the uh, young men in Texas suddenly went silent on the issue. Now, if you, if the jump from 2008 to 2009 was allegedly a leap year, then the move from 2009 to 2010 should have been a regular year, at least if they're going on the uh, metonic cycle. Now, in, in other words, from 2009 to 2010, the date should have slid back. But Tahar knew that if he let the date slide back in 2010, it would again wind up in February. So, attempting to avoid that and contradicting the bluffs of his followers in Texas, Tahar jumped the date of Passover ahead again for the second year in a row. Now, for the men in Man Up Jacob, who, or Man Up Yaikwab, or whatever, you know, for those young men who tried to pretend that Tahar was going on the uh, rabbinical calendar and the cycle that it has, uh, we would like to ask, when does the, the cycle ever have two leap years back to back, two consecutive leap years? In fact, I'd like to show this clip of Tahar's young followers in Texas back in 2009, pretending that they knew what was going on and pretending that Tahar was, you know, on this uh, cycle of the rabbinic calendar. Watch how, after covering the dates for 2008 and 2009, they try to predict the dates for 2010 and 2011, and notice how they get the dates wrong, predicting that Tahar's calendar would slide back in 2010. All right, now just to prove it, I went out and I got the um, I got the phases of the new moon from the um, I got the phases of the new moon from the, uh, the, the navy. navy. All right. Label, uh, Come in and see if we get a shot of oceanography. All right. Now, this this was the new moon leading into spring last year. All right. Fourteen days later, we had the Passover, the night of the, what what on the Greg, Gregorian calendar they call the twentieth. All right. Last year was a leap year. All right. So what it what it what did the document say happens on a leap year in Hebrew? In the Hebrew calendar, it jumps forth. Right. And it's normally 19 days longer, right, than a solar year, right? Right. So that's that's about give or take 19 days, all right? Because it said about 19 days. Oh, now, hold it steady. To the 25th, from the 7th to the okay. 25th. Okay. All right. Now, go next year, all right? From the 25th, we on a regular cycle now. God willing, we out of here, but if we have to do the Passover one more year, it's gonna be on a regular year, so it's 11 days shorter. Is that not 11 days shorter than the 25th? God willing, we out of here, but let's say next year we gotta do the Passover. This, from that, is 11 days shorter. Is that not 11 days shorter? Uh, we now come to Tahar's actual transition from 2010 to 2011. As was noted earlier in this video, only part of Tahar's calendar slid back, so his Passover started about a week ago, uh, on the 17th of March. Now, to answer the question I asked earlier, how could a man who claims to be a prophet and claims to be the only one with the true understanding of, of the scriptures make so many basic errors? Uh, the reason, the answer, is because Tahar isn't what he boasts to be. You know, he's not what he claims to be. We can see that with the calendar. We can see that he's stumbling around in darkness, and he's just trying to wing it, and he's been just trying to wing it for quite a few years now. Now, before closing this video, it should be noted that Tahar and his followers sometimes try to justify all these errors by noting that Judges 5.11 employs the phrase, quote, rehearse the righteous acts, end quote. They try to pretend that this passage means they're just rehearsing right now, so they don't have to get anything correct, they're just practicing. They're twisting that passage. First of all, even if we agreed that the word rehearse in that, in, you know, meant it in the modern sense, does anyone really believe that it means that it's okay for a man who claims to be a prophet and the leader of the believers to just give a continuously sloppy and half-hearted attempt at getting the days right? Does anyone really think the, the word rehearse means that Tahar doesn't even have to bother knowing how to count to 12 correctly? The reality is that the contradictions we saw in the various calendars aren't honest mistakes. They're not the honest mistakes of a man trying his hardest or trying his best. Rather, these are the errors of a man who's playing games, a man who is insincere, lacking humility, and who's prideful, and, as I said earlier, who's too lazy to do anything more than just wing it. Furthermore, uh, reaching for Judges 5.11 is a desperation move on their behalf. The verse doesn't say what Tahar thinks it says. They're confused by the 17th century English. Note that in Exodus 17.14, Moses 
Moses is ordered by God, is order, excuse me, Moses is ordered to do the following. Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. 1 Samuel 8.21 says Samuel heard the words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. Now, what does that mean, to rehearse something in somebody else's ears? In, in the English of the 17th century, the word rehearse could mean to recount or recite. That's why other translations of Judges 5.11 have recite the righteous acts or recount the righteous acts. So Judges 5.11 doesn't justify the sloppy games Tahar has, Tahar has played with the calendar, nor does it hide the fact that he's dishonest about how much knowledge he has and that he's been trying to just wing it for all these years. He may have fooled some of his followers with that shell game, but we here at Truth After Knowledge saw through the deception.